this week now uh, we're going to be switching gears going from what last week was was welcoming somebody from kind of our peripheral vision uh, to carving down into our center uh, staying close to home focusing on homes but uh, before we get to that we're going to have Deacon Chuck if you're at the ready lead us in in prayer I'm at the ready <clears throat> um, Thank you, Michael, uh, for acknowledging the situation we're in these days. And uh, so we want to take it to the Lord in prayer. Um, in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> Lord, I thank you for St. Michael's Parish. It's long history here in, in, in Portland, um, the Italian uh, beginning of this parish. And uh, you brought us forward, Lord, uh, with that beginning. But now we welcome members, uh, people of all nationalities. and. Lord, I pray for St. Michael Parish. I've prayed from the beginning that it would be a holy parish, and certainly the call now is upon us to be a holy parish uh, and to spread the light of Christ into the darkness that seems to be so strong near us. So, um, Lord, please bless us as a parish. Help us to be strong with the light of Christ. Um, bless, uh, uh, you know, Jeff and Andrea and Tony as they share about the Italian beginnings, but. We thank you for that, Lord, your presence and all those wonderful people and help us be a holy parish and a light to Portland. Uh, so bless this time together tonight and send your Holy Spirit to us. And so we pray always again in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Okay, so uh, to introduce introduce our speakers, you can check, I already mentioned uh, there are three names. We have pretty credible historians, at least judging by life experience. I got um, Jeff and, and Tony both sent me their bios, um, and it was almost astonishing to me um, how much time they've spent in the area and how much they've given to, to St. Michael's. Tony has the longest lineage <laughs> to brag of by a mile. Her, her parents were parishioners at St. Michael's for 67 years. She was baptized at St. Michael's in 1948. She attended elementary school at Southwest 4th and Harrison, so right down the way. And then she went to St. Mary's Academy, which I think was still right across the street from, from St. Michael's, graduated from there, then jumped over to uh, Portland State, um, where she received a master's in education and then later a master's in special education. So it really is her corridor. Um, she'll be speaking second. First, we have Jeff and Andrea, who will be leading us off. Um, and Jeff mentioned to me that the, the Bofaro family has been in Portland since 1912. Jeff has been a parishioner here at St. Michael's starting off in 1977, then married Andrea in, in 1978. And he now has continued the kind of Portland state local connection works um, in international affairs at, at PSU. So these three have been uh, around the block. They've spent much of their lives, in fact, around the block um, and will be in a good position to inform us uh, about St. Michael's history. Um, so we will start off with Jeff and Andrea. Go on ahead. Okay, everyone. Uh, well, thank you for joining us tonight. Uh, first of all, I'd like to say right off the bat, I'm no expert on the uh, long history of St. Michael's, um, and a lot of it is anecdotal from my uh, father's family um, over the years as well. So uh, to make it easier on everybody, I've come up with a very basic PowerPoint that I'm going to share as I go through this, and Tony will and my wife will jump in whenever they see fit. Are we ready? Ready. Andiamo. See. Okay. Can everybody see this slide? Yes. Okay. So this is just kind of a chronological history of St. Michael's. Uh, I've left a lot of things out, obviously. So these are just kind of the high points according to me. Um, 
So there was a college in those days, a school uh, for boys and orphans that was actually where St. Michael's is in the 1870s, 80s and 90s, believe it or not, St. Michael's College. And there was a chapel there. And that was really the first church. Um, then St. Michael's Chapel kind of became St. Michael's Parish um, by default. There was St. Lawrence down the street, um, but by this time there were quite a few Italians living in the Jewish and Italian neighborhood, and um, not many of them spoke English, so they felt they kind of needed their own parish, and so St. Michael's Chapel um, got kind of a makeover, and that became kind of the Italian parish. So then good old Father Cestelli comes along, um, and in November, um, they raise money, and the cornerstone that we see in the church now that says 1901 was laid, and by June, they had the dedication, um, believe it or not, and uh, St. Michael's was one of the first churches in Portland that actually wasn't made of wood because they had the Italian uh, craftsmen and mason. Mm -hmm. And uh, I wanted to make sure that everybody knew our beloved um, Natalie Terraglio, her grandfather worked on the basement of St. Michael's uh, in that foundation back then too. And anyway. Jeff, if, Jeff, if I can just interject on that cornerstone, these immigrants raised $15,000 and they weren't making more than 30 or $40 at a time in a short, like a four months to build the church. So they were really devoted to the Italian church and as immigrants, but to raise that kind of money in a short amount of time. And uh, the stained glass windows were made by the Povey Company in Portland that was kind of the premier window maker. And I read something in, a, in the history that um, in 1977, the windows alone were valued at um, over $250,000. They were uh, renovated back then. So anyway, we had the famous Father Balestra that Balestra Hall was named after, uh, came to St. Michael's in uh, 1910 and was there till 1957. Okay, so you can look at these other dates uh, down here. There was a school from 1909 to 1934, urban renewal hit, 1958, which essentially destroyed the old neighborhood. Um, Father uh, Aldo, I say also, ooh, what a typo. <laughs> Father Aldo, who married us in 1978, was here for quite a while. Father Blibben, some of you know, and then the modern era, Father Griffin, Father Perry, Father Mayo, and then the St. John Society. Hmm. Hmm. Okay, so I just wanted to point out that there's this uh, book that Fred Granada put together in 1994 for uh, the 100th anniversary uh, of the actual St. Michael's Parish. And um, I've got a couple of copies. I know Tony gave a copy to Father Ignacio. There's probably more copies available too. And I would recommend this you know, borrowing a copy and going through it if you have the interest. Okay, and I'm just going to go through some photos, uh, some of which I've taken out of that uh, booklet and some other areas again. St. Michael's College back uh, in the 1870s, 80s. Then it was the Blanche Institute after that. 
Uh, I love that. Day school for boys and young men. Um, maybe we need more of those today. <laughs> okay, here's an interesting map also from that booklet showing the old St. Michael's Parish area. You can see up at the top middle uh, where St. Michael's is, uh, fifth and fourth there between Market and Mill. Um, anyway, all these little dots and dashes throughout here, the little circles, dots, are Italian homes. Um, some of, let's say it looks like the dashes are Jewish households and the mixed ones are the mixed households. Um, I know my family lived on Corbett Street, um, probably about um, around Mead or Hooker down there. Um, mm -hmm. And we lived on Mead Street and our house is still there. Right. And, you know, Markham Gulch there was a dump um, at the time. And again, the Jews and the Italians pretty much uh, shared the neighborhood and got along pretty well, actually. Uh, my father told stories that he and his brothers used to have to fend off uh, other boys for their newspaper corners because that's how they made money for the family, selling newspapers. So sometimes the three of them would have to team up. Okay. Here's a photo of what the old neighborhood looked like. This is again, probably uh, very early 1900s. You can see it was not very fancy um, at all. Um, and again, most of these homes are gone now. Okay, here's a picture of what the old St. Michael's Chapel actually looked like. I think this is about 1900. And again, another photo, the interior of the church, as you can see, Christmas 1924. You can see the big creche presepio there on the left. And um, the two, you can see the two big paintings on the left or the right uh, that used to be there until um, the renovation, well, the almost renovation of uh, a few years ago were taken out. And they're in storage somewhere, I know that. Um, I put this cartoon, if you want to call it that, in there to remind everybody that during the 1920s, uh, Portland and Oregon had a very active KKK uh, movement here. And um, I can remember my dad's family talking about in the 20s that these guys would ride around St. Michael's uh, in their white habits on horses um, riding around St. Michael's back then because they were primarily Catholic and then the Jews around there too. So um, I'm not sure how many people know that history of St. Michael's. You're not saying that the KKK was Catholic. He was just saying that anti -Catholic. they were anti-Catholic. That's why they were there. Um, 1945 interior of St. Michael's. Um, so we can go back a little bit. And you can see the difference there. Um, that's actually in the 20s, they had a pretty cool portrait of St. Michael's there. Yeah. The, um, so these, this is the 40s. This is the 70s. This is actually our wedding, 1978. And other than the light fixtures, this is pretty much how St. Michael's looked up until 2017 when we moved over to St. Mary's. Except I think the communion rail was gone before that too. But Okay, I threw this in. This is a photo of the famous uh, Father Cestelli 
that built St. Michael's and it, they said he actually helped in the construction uh, as well. Um, fortunately for him, the rectory caught on fire in 1905 and he was seriously burned um, in that. Um, but the nuns across the street, Jeff, at St. Mary's, because St. Mary's, the old St. Mary's was where the parking lot is now. Right. That was the original historical St. Mary's and the nuns heard him calling out that there was a fire. And that's, I think, how he was saved because the nuns yeah. was the fire well. department. Okay, here's just some photos again of um, some notable priests there of St. Michael's. Um, Father Balestra in the middle, uh, Father Aldo up in the top left, who was there from what, 59 to 83, married us along with my uncle. My uncle's down there in the bottom right, um, Father Anthony Buffaro, and then the bottom left is Father San Pietro. Both my uncle and he were alumni of St. Michael's and St. Michael's School as well. Um, to uh, just an aside, my uncle, um, he um, studied at the Gregoriana in Rome and then also ended up um, he was in Nome, Alaska for a while, but ultimately the last 30 years, he ended up at the Italian parish in St. Rita's, Tacoma, and they used to have exchanges with St. Michael's too, and uh, most of his parish there were Italian at that time. Here's a picture of uh, Father Balestra with my grandfather. This is probably about 1935. Uh, our family actually moved out of South Portland, St. Michael's in, a, in 1929 uh, to the new suburb of Selwood. Uh, and uh, Father Blester would drive over in his Model A and visit with our family. Have dinner. And have dinner, of course. This is the Buffaro family. This is probably about 1925. Left, on the left is your dad. Yeah, on the left side is my father. Cool. This is my father's 1918 St. Michael's eighth grade graduation photo. He's in the middle and there were all five students, four of them were girls. I love it. Yeah. This is my dad's gang. Uh, this is, again, probably about 1925 or so, 26. Um, he's there, the real tall guy on the far right, uh, second from the far right. His buddy Gino Caputo's there with his arms around him. Another photo, class of 1930 and 33, um, St. Michael's. Was quite formal compared to a lot of things now. Um, I threw this in. Um, this is the invitation to come to my uncle's first mass that he said himself. Um, at St. Michael's, 1932. Um, obviously, you'll notice it's all in Italian. So his first mass was at St. Michael's. Yes. This is here because uh, during World War II, my uncle was assigned to the Italian internment camp in Missoula, Montana. And uh, this is kind of a reminder of me, but this was a gift to my uncle. It's a watercolor painted by one of the Italians, you know, just a typical, uh, pretty much, I think, Northern Italian scene. But anyway, on the back, there was an inscription thanking my uncle for taking care of them during their internment. 
a uh, very famous St. Michael's uh, alum, um, David Kingsley, a graduate of St. Michael's, uh, who gave his life, gave his parachute to a wounded gunner in a B-17 during World War II. And he went down with the plane. Uh, everybody else got out okay. Oh, oh, this is us, our wedding, 1978, with my uncle, St. Michael's. I don't know if any of you have seen this article, but it's also a, a kind of a description of, you know, what happened to Portland's Italian neighborhoods. Um, so I'd recommend that too. It's in the Willamette Week. Well, you can just, yeah. yeah, look it up at Willamette Week. Just Google it and it'll come up pretty easily. It was 2017. Hmm. Right. right. Yeah. Um, Tony, do you want to take over? Okie doke. And please uh, feel free to enter anything you can think of. So as uh, Michael said, my parents were John and Gilda Roberti and they were parishioners of St. Michael's for 67 years. Um, St. Michael's did become the center of Little Italy, the Chiesa, as it was known. And Father Belester would say mass, of course, in Italian. And um, many of the immigrants who needed help with all their documents would find people that would be able to transcribe. So a lot of my stories are personal and come from my mother and my two brothers who were altar boys. But my mother was known as the scribe, one of the scribes. So I remember uh, many, many immigrants coming over to our house where my mom would write. They would talk in Italian to my mother. My mother would write the letters in Italian and then would mail them for the immigrants that came for their relatives in Italy. So she did that for years. We remember sitting around the yellow Formica table always having pizzellis or biscottis and coffee and mom being the scribe. But she was very involved with the church. I think most of the women were at that time. You know, she and I both did a lot of the washing, especially she did the linens, the altar cloths. And I think I've mentioned that before when we did another presentation in Blester Hall. But you know, the linens were holy cloths. And I remember my mother, when she would iron those holy cloths and we had the ironing board that came down from the wall that she'd always say, Antonietta, come a hold of these cloths that they're holy and you cannot have them a touch of the floor. Mm -hmm. And so we would then, you know, she'd iron and I'd be walking and then we'd fold them and then we'd walk them back up to St. Michael's. Well, not only did she, and then she also washed the cassocks and surplices of the altar boys and iron them pristine with starch. Um, we also, part of the St. Michael's Altar Society, our job was to clean, the, at that time they had the little tea lights that you could, you know, for a nickel, light your tea lights, and then the big votive candles. And so at the end of each month, we were responsible for cleaning out the votive candles, the large ones, and then replacing all the little tea lights with new ones and replacing the missiles. So that was when I was in like grade school. So, and also in preparation for all the religious holy days, um, we would go and clean the church and the sanctuary so it was spotless. And we would also prepare meals for all of the um, events that took place. So for baptisms, for holy communions, for graduations, for weddings and funerals. And, you know, these were not little spreads. These were like, you know, the deli trays, the homemade potato salads, the homemade macaroni salads the pastrami, the salami, the provolone, the mozzarella, you name it, it was there for all those that needed comfort. So in addition, um, I remember also mom always bringing homemade pasta and meatballs, Italian cookies to Father Balestra. And that uh, tradition continued all the way to through Father uh, Mayo until my mother was probably about 92, 93 years old and when her health was beginning to fail. But, and during that time when Father Belester was the parish priest for that many years, Father Belester actually would walk about monthly to our home and have Sunday dinner with us. Um, and that was a real treat to have, you know, you were honored to have the parish priest come to your house for dinner. That was cool. Um, so the other 
stories is kind of the flip side. I, I contacted my two brothers to find out what they're remembered of St. Michael's and um, they were both ingrained as the altar boys. My brother John is seven years older than I am and he and my brother Gene, who's five years older than I am, felt really comfortable in going over to Father Balestra and being there maybe a half an hour to an hour before services. Father Balestra just welcomed them because he said, what better way than to have these altar boys in the Father's house, capital F. So better to be in the Father's house here before mass. And they would read magazines, they play on the organ, and it did not bother Father at all. So I asked my brother, John, he says he remembers Father Balestra having very short sermons, about five minutes max. That was five minutes to eight minutes. But the irony was about every now and then, so that when we talk about the bell tower, he'd have my brother John go up and capture one of the squabs, which were baby pigeons, because that was a delicacy that Father Balestra liked to eat. So Brother John would catch one of the squab squabs and bring it down for Father Balestra so that he could, unfortunately, kill it and then eat it. But it was a delicacy. And squabs are only about four weeks old. But on the flip side, my brother Eugene, who's five years older than I am, he remembers Father Balestra asking him to go to the crow's nest, not the bell tower, the crow's nest, and clean all the pigeons' droppings. So there's those two. <laughs> he also remembers that the altar boys wore red and white cassocks and surplices. And so we thought maybe that was more European and formal at the time instead of the black and white. And that in the eyes of a nine and 10 year old boy, he always remembered that Father Balestra always liked more wine than water in his chalice. So, <laughs> so from um, 1971, so we, Jim and I had moved to Salem um, in 1971 when Jim went to work for the Department of Justice. So for 23 years, we were gone in Salem at that time. But when we returned to Portland in, in 2001, uh, where we were had lived, our parish would have been cathedral. And so Jim and I had gone to cathedral for a while and just didn't feel like home. And my mom was still active at St. Michael's. And so then Jim and I switched, became members again at St. Michael's. And um, it just was more of a feeling of family and community where I had grown up. And we, um, so we've been attending for the past 19 years. And uh, during those years, Jim and I have served as ushers at the 430 Vigil Mass. And then I was on the parish council for three years before becoming the parish chair uh, from 2018 to 2019. But since the coronavirus has begun, the rest is history and I miss everybody, but we're fortunate enough to be able to live stream uh, Father's Masses every Sunday and participate in any of the activities, especially when we're praying for peace, the 24 hours of peace, which was awesome. So hopefully in the not so distant future, we'll all be back together again. So that's my take on St. Michael's. Thank you, Tony. Yes. Great. Thank you. You bet. Yeah, and thank you to the Buffaros for yeah. highlighting those photos. Yeah. That's not always easy to do, to go from multiple sources and tug on people's sleeve to, to get them. So appreciate that. And then the, um, the storytelling from Tony. So, so for- I wanted to add one thing. Mm -hmm, yeah. Since I didn't really say much during just, <laughs> um, the, my history is that uh, my grandparents actually went to St. Michael's also, um, the Pianovis, um, Silvio and Margarina Pianovi. And when my grandmother came over, I believe they got married at St. Michael's, but it's funny because like we don't really have a lot of um, dates and everything, but then they moved over to where Holy Family is now, that area, and had a farm. But um, we, already, we always talked about them being a part of St. Michael's early on, and I just wanted to throw that in. Mm. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Okay, 